Welcome back to the Pursuit Podcast. Today, we're going to be taking a look at getting into functional programming and getting that first job. If you haven't learned functional programming yet, don't worry. We've got you covered in the next episode. Quickly, thank you to our sponsors. Nexamo provides APIs that allow developers to quickly and seamlessly integrate voice, SMS, authentication, and a host of other really interesting things into their workflows. You can find out more about their products at Nexamo.com, or you can thank them for sponsoring us on Twitter at, at NexamoDev. I'm your host, Jessica Rose. I'm here today with... John Stevenson. John Stevenson, what do you do? I currently work for a financial services company, and I'm leading a group of developers who are programming in Clojure, a functional programming language. Very, very exciting. And today we're actually going to be talking about functional programming as a career, if I understand. Yeah, it should be really great. It's it's what a lot of people are getting excited about. It's not as hard as you may think it actually is. So this week, we're going to be talking about functional programming both on the Tuesday episode and on the Thursday one. And we're sort of leading with the leading with the carrot, not how to learn functional programming, but maybe what you can do once you learn it. Does functional programming have a lot of jobs out there? I think in, if you're in the right location, there are an infinite amount of opportunities. Certainly London is a hotbed of functional programming. And obviously San Francisco is another place as well where it's, it's really taking off. But there are plenty of other places where people are doing functional programming as well. There's, there's quite a few companies down in Bristol and Bath area that are using functional programming. And there's a lot of people now moving to more remote work as well. So I think the, the only limitation is your interest in actually going out and find these opportunities or even making opportunities with inside your own company as well. There's lots of companies that are kind of Java shops or, or JavaScript or Ruby. And they're moving over to more functional things, not necessarily for every project, but there's an opportunity to introduce functional programming into the company that you're currently working for as well. So you mentioned that you work in financial services. Is there quite a bit of functional work being done over in financial services? Oh, yes. Like banks and very traditional. Why is that? Or why might that be? Well, obviously, the banks are very wary about like telling people what they're doing because they, they want to have this competitive advantage. Uh, they want to be able to beat their competition. They want to be first. It's a very, very uh, I want to win kind of environment, which does take a bit of getting used to. But it's they see new things and they evaluate a lot of things. But the things that stick are the things that they believe give them this competitive advantage, allows them to do more, allows them to do things faster, to be able to do things that they couldn't do before. And functional programming over the last, I guess even over the last 10 years or so, has kind of grown into that space where they really kind of rely on it to give them that advantage. That's really exciting as well. So saying like, oh, you know what, financial services uses a lot of functional programming or they're really interested in it for secret reasons. Well, yeah, they don't like to tell people about this sort of stuff because they don't want to lose that advantage. But uh, so it, it's kind of you kind of have to be involved in that a little bit to understand what they're looking at. But it's not hard to see it from the outside either if you take a few moments to look about stuff. So we, there's a lot of trends that kind of lead what people are actually doing day-to-day -day work. So there's obviously there's artificial intelligence gets lots of the big uh, attention, but it's things like the big data. And it, that's a very general term. But what we're finding with a lot of things we're building is we're building things with much more data than we were ever doing before. I mean, unless you're just building a nice little kind of website that does something very specific, you're probably, even, even then, you're pulling in data from different sites. If you go to like a price comparisons website, I mean, the logic of that is is fairly easy to understand, but they're pulling in all this information from like hundreds or thousands or millions of different sources to be able to understand how to do what those price comparisons are. So we're dealing with so much more data these days that it does require like a shift in how we think about things as well. We can't model everything as if it was a cat or a car or a kind of classic OO way of everything's an object. We have to kind of think about things differently. So that's really interesting. This really invites us to back up a little bit. So we've got, I'm, I'm not modest. I, I think we've got some of the most uh, <laughs> lovely audiences I've, I've ever encountered listening to this podcast, but not all of them are developers and not all of them are super experienced developers. Talk to me about these cats and cars. It'll just be a review for everybody who has made a lot of cats and made a lot of cars. 
It's kind of interesting to see how the software industry has evolved. It's still evolving. It's still fairly young as an industry. So we don't have like the one way of doing things. Back in the kind of 80s and early 90s. Then, oh, way, way back in the 80s, you know, the dim, dark times. <laughs> when I was still alive, um, yeah. <laughs> It was all about trying to model the world and to trying to understand how we can model the world inside our computers. So this is where we get sort of the, the very fundamental sort of object-oriented constructs we often talk about in programming. So I'm going to make a, yeah. not, not an actual cat, that seems like a bit of work, I'm going to make a, a digital cat and I'm going to give it these properties and I'm going to reproduce it. So sort of everything's an object and then you do things with objects? Yeah, exactly. Yes, yeah, so everything's an object. You define objects, then you. Um, there was a big interest in doing object hierarchies. So you have like the general properties of cat, and then you have specific cats. So you might have pedigree cats and uh, non-pedigree cats, and they have different properties as well. But they all inherit from a common set of properties. Or for for example, cars. Cars. You drive a car. Your car has wheels and so on. But a Lamborghini is very much different from a Mini. In, in its characteristics as well, but essentially they have a common property. One of the concepts of OO was to kind of build these hierarchies that make it easier to add new things to your design, but still have a, a common way to talk to them. Got it. So object-oriented, we're talking about making a thing, doing the thing, specifying the things. We're just, it's things all the way down. Yeah, and so kind of modeling all this stuff was supposed to make things like nice and easy, and on a certain level, it does. It helps you model something in the way that we normally think about things, because humans think about patterns. We think about house. A house has a door. We can open the door to get into the house. If we didn't have that common understanding of what a door was and what a house was, we'd have to kind of learn that each time we actually used a house which would be very confusing. So if you go to a house that doesn't have a door, well, how do you get in? I mean, you don't know, because he's so used to having that door. It kind of provides a standard way of using something. We've sort of kind of generally and messily described what object-oriented programming is. And this is doing things for things with, well, we're going to, I'm going to stop saying things. But this gets a little bit more confusing because what you and I are talking about today isn't object-oriented programming. It isn't all the things. We're talking about a different programming paradigm. Yeah, exactly. So it, in a way, it's actually simpler than OO. I think when most people start learning object-oriented languages like Java, you spend months just trying to understand how to build an object. With functional programming, you're thinking more about the data you're working with specifically and, and what you want to do with it. And how you do something with data in a functional programming language is by using a function. So you write some functions that will work on a piece of data, that will do something to it. So example, you might have a function that adds something to your shopping basket. So you have, as you're working around Amazon, you, you add or remove things from a shopping basket, and that's done by different functions. And you have this data model, which is your shopping basket, which you have over the course of your shopping. And then you either, you either buy it or you, um, you, know, you decide not to buy it and save some money. When you decide to buy something, then that shopping basket can go off to another system as a piece of data. It doesn't matter what kind of design you had in the actual shopping experience. You can go to another system, which is the fulfillment system, which actually makes sure that your uh, packages arrive on time. And you, you just send it, typically you just send it a piece of data. Uh, most people nowadays are using things like JSON to send data over. The, the design you have in your shopping cart doesn't have to be the same as the way you've designed your fulfillment system because they do different things anyway, so you want them to behave differently. So fantastic. Instead of everything being an object, everything is a potential action that can be communicated as data? Or most things, most things. Yeah. Are potential yeah. that. I mean, you have more of a view that everything is data or what, what you're actually going to do to that piece of data. In, in Clojure, which is a functional programming language, that they blur the lines even closer because actually our programming language is defined as a data structure as well. So it's a lot closer. So everything's basically data in Clojure. I love how you were like, oh, you should try functional programming. For a lot of people, it's going to be much easier than what you've tried to date. But then followed that up with, it's going to be completely different than anything you've ever used. Good luck. Well, this is it. I mean, if you switch operating systems, so you switch from like Mac to PC or PC to Mac or Linux and so on, then actually some things are a lot easier to do in, in the other operating system, but you're used to using a computer one way uh, and you've learned all its idiosyncrasies and the strange ways that you use it. So actually moving over from 
Windows to Mac, then you can probably do things a lot easier, but you first have to learn how to do those things easier. And so there's that kind of cognitive distance that actually actually you have to bridge that gap or or forget some of the things you learned previously or put them to the back of your mind and then take a, a different approach. John, early in our chat, you talked about how there is this market for folks who want to work with functional programming, of course, in London and Berlin and San Francisco, but also in other markets and remote or to bring it into your own job. Well, your own existing job. Yeah, if you're looking for work, you're looking for work. Are there any communities or are there any resources where you're like, oh, if you want to work in functional programming, go here first? Yeah, there are lots of ways to do it. I always think that the best way to get a job is to know somebody who's looking for somebody to hire. So yeah, getting involved in a community or just even attending one of the community events is a great way to do that. I mean, in London, there's things like the London Closurians Meetup Group. Closurians? Uh, Oh, closureians, yes. Oh. But there's also like Haskell groups. There's even a functional JavaScript group as well. And there's some people doing Elixir, which is functional programming uh, language as well, on Erlang platform. Oh, um, that's very cool. Yes, yeah, so there's quite a lot. I mean, you basically just put functional programming into meetup.com and you'll find <laughs> tons of stuff there. So your first advice is to go be nice to other humans in MeetSpace. Well, it, that's kind of how it works, really, isn't it, I think? <laughs> or I believe the, the more formal, more networking. But just go be nice. No, just go be nice. Don't, don't, don't think of it as networking. That kills it for me. Like, oh, I don't want to network. But you can go along and be nice to people. Talk about stuff you want to do. Or get them to talk about things that they're interested in. And then you'll find out, like, all the interview questions they would ever ask you anyway <laughs> if, if you uh, got a job. Because if they're talking about what they're doing and you find out what their opinions are, then you, at least you have something to talk about if you do get an interview. I love how we've gone from like the, the very, very super secret things that all, that, well, I'm not going to say all, that most folks in fintech want to do to very, very super secret stealth interview prep. Hey, how is it working at such and such? Oh, what, what's going on with the team? <laughs> well, exactly. Yeah, I mean, you're going to ask those questions anyway. Uh, in the, well, hopefully you ask those questions in an interview situation. But I want to ask, you don't have to wait until find out. I mean, I, I guess when I did look around for a new job about a year ago, I kind of already knew who I wanted to work for and who I didn't want to work for because I, I'd kind of met people from there and I knew, I knew the things that you would learn in the interview and a lot of things you wouldn't learn from the interview as well. Oh. Um, yeah, so it was really good. So yeah, just being part of the community. And again, it's the best way to get hired is for them to want you rather than for you to convince them that they want you. So if you go and do an interesting talk or in, even just an interesting blog post, I know people who have got jobs at UBS just on the strength of one blog post that they wrote, but it, it struck a chord with that, that person who was involved in the hiring and they got a job that way. So this seems rather two-pronged. So first, go out and chat to people, make friends. And on the other side, like sort of aim, if you can, and if you want to, to go a little bit more visible, to say, hey, I know this thing. Is anybody need this thing? Yeah, exactly. I mean, they, they can't hire you if they don't know who you are. And the more they know about you or your opinions and your ideas, that's what they're hiring you for. It's not just to tap some random things into a keyboard. They're hiring you for your skills and opinions and decision making and, and, and the ability to kind of learn and adapt as well. And I think that's a fantastic point. Like if you're aiming to be a bit more visible and like show off your technical skills that you kind of want to make sure you're putting your be best foot forward. They, they may want to hire you for your skills or your knowledge or your experience or your opinions. But if your opinions are garbage and you're really hostile, it's going to be a hard sell, eh? Yeah, exactly. And it's much better to find that out when you go into a, like a meetup rather than actually finding out in an interview because then obviously you, you're not going to get the job in the interview. Whereas at least in the meetups, you can practice talking to people uh, and, and getting on with people. I, I mean, I've heard from other people when they've been hiring stuff that the reason they hired one person over another is because they thought the team would just get along with them better. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, and, and some people will actually hire you for the day or bring you in for the day and just sit down and pair with the team. I mean, that's your interview process. So the more you can get on with people and ask them questions and, and not be afraid of, of kind of demonstrating that you don't understand everything, but you're willing to learn. I think that's what most companies actually want. I think in, yeah, in decent interview processes, pair programming isn't about show me everything you know. It's about, well, at least when, when I've used them in interview processes, it's about show me how you communicate, show me what you're interested in, yeah, exactly. show me the weird shape of your exciting problem solving. 
yeah, can we can we work together? Can we reason? Can we understand each other? I mean, that's the crux of any kind of job, really. Can you actually understand the people you're working with? And if you can, then you can do things together. If you can't, then you're just battling against each other. So you mentioned that you were looking for work about a year ago before you got into this new role in financial services. Let's go ahead and build up a hypothetical. I would like to take our beloved dear listener with us on a journey where we go and hunt for a job in functional programming. So, um, yeah, give me a language. What, like, what? I will be the job seeker. What language or languages should I have gotten under my belt before I, I sort of dive into the job market? Well, that's that's interesting. I, I know some people who basically just learned one language and got jobs with it. So one of my friends, well, they started learning C and, and C++ a little bit, but then we showed them Clojure, and then within a few months of learning Clojure, they'd got a job. Oh, okay. So I think you can just dive straight into a functional programming language. You don't have to learn all the kind of the more common languages. You don't have to learn JavaScript or Java or Ruby or Python and stuff like that. But it does depend a little bit on the kind of area you want to go into. I do love the way you were like, oh, you know, you can learn any of them or any of them. But, you know, closure, just real subtle, like, hey, yeah, closure. Yeah. Well, I have a complete bias for closure, <laughs> uh, as you might uh, discover in this, this podcast. I think it's a nice language to start learning in. It's, okay. It's great. That's where we are. I am a closure dev. Okay. I've been self-studying and teaching myself for a while. What kinds of things would you like to see in my portfolio? Or I know it's a cliche, but see up on my GitHub. So yeah. what should I have ready to show off before I'm ready to go talk to people? That's a really good question. I, I think it does depend a little bit on the company you're going to see. Um, but yeah, having built something that's more than just a to-do list, but a to-do list is a good start. <laughs> and and you can make a to-do list as complicated as you want to. But I think actually being able to convey the way you designed it, to explain the choices that you made when you actually built it as well. I think that's as, as important as the, I mean, you can see that in some of the code, but you can see what you've done in the code, but actually explaining why you made those decisions, because somebody might just read the code and think, okay, well, that why, why would you do that? You wouldn't do that, you'd do this because they don't have the context in how you were thinking. But if you also include that either either in comments or writing a, like a design guide for, for how you built something, then it explains the decisions you made. And people go, oh, okay, in that context, that does make sense. I should build a thing, yeah. which probably shouldn't be a to-do app unless it's extremely cool. And then I should just document the heck out of it? Well, you should explain yourself. Yeah, I mean, you don't have to kind of document every single thing, but what are the major factors? Why did you build it that way? Like, tell a story of how you built it, what challenges you had when you built it, how did you overcome those challenges? You could actually, yeah, you could write a little kind of like couple of page story about why you did what you did and how you did it. <laughs> it helps people understand the way you think. Because if you just show somebody the code, that's the end of the journey. How did you actually get there? Nice. That's really interesting. So even writing something like a tutorial or something where other folks learning could follow along yes. might be a really fantastic way to say, hey, I understand this. And it's, it's sort of an adage. If you don't understand it well enough to explain to a seven-year-old, you don't understand it. But saying, I understand this so completely that I've actually made a simple guide for you to follow and build your own. Yeah, I, I'd probably hire somebody on the strength of a tutorial uh, because, okay. like, it's, because it's one thing that so many developers do badly is there oh there's a code okay ship it but if you want to do anything with it you have to spend time describing how, how it works and so on what's the background to how they got there and why did they make those decisions sometimes you can get that from the code but not always and so actually having that understanding that shared kind of learning it's, it's what you do get obviously when you're pair programming or mob programming you get that collective understanding of the approach you've taken but when you're just looking at a final piece of code, then it's not there. But a tutorial or a workshop, or even a small book, I mean, that kind of does help you express yourself and express your ideas and, and opinions. And they don't have to be right. They don't have to be universally accepted. But you'd make a statement and put your ideas forward. Um, even if somebody disagrees with them, then a discussion point and, and you can talk about things within certain contexts. This is right. Or this is the way you would do in another context. Or you would do it this way. Fantastic. So I've... Learn some closure. Mm -hmm. I built a cute thing. It's not a to-do app. And then I've, I've documented it out. So I've, I've written really clean comments in my code. I've written a tutorial so people can follow along. What do I do next? Do I now networking or do I apply places or both? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's obviously you do your sort of background research to figure out what kind of companies you want to go work for. Even if they're using functional programming, it doesn't mean that 
that's the company you want to work for. So you need to find out a little bit about that. So that's going to meetups, finding out people, uh, following people who you know are working at certain companies and, and finding out what they're talking about. And and also going to the meetups as well. I, even giving a little lightning talk about the project you built. Developers like to hear those uh, experience reports. Even experienced closure developers like to understand how somebody new to the environment is actually managed to get on, see if we need to actually make any improvements to how we help people learn closure. So you said one thing in passing, which I think was really interesting, and I'd love to dive in a bit deeper. You were touching on how just because a company is using the technology you're interested in doesn't mean that you necessarily want to work for them. <laughs> Could you talk to me about... <laughs> oh, maybe there's more to this story. Um, can you talk to me about, so if folks are just getting into technology or if they haven't interviewed a lot, or let's say, unfortunately, maybe they'd have interviewed and they've wound up some really gnarly places in the past, what kinds of things would you recommend? Like, what are some red flags or what are some very green flags for good company culture? Like, what should we be looking out for? Uh, I mean, I guess there are, understanding what business they're in is obviously, I guess, the simplest thing to do is to see what they're doing. I mean, if they're in publishing, do you agree with the stance that they take? If they're in financial services, are they ethically involved? Do you care whether they're an ethical company? That sort of thing is, is kind of like the basics you can look at, but but also the so just a personal baseline. Like, uh, is this too evil for me? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Google says do no evil. Do we believe them? Uh, I think they cut that from their mission statement. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, that that <laughs> might. Um, I mean, what that may have been the case uh, when they first started. Is it still the case now? Do they do evil? Is, is Facebook owning up to its responsibilities, or is it just covering up to implicating things? That's the decision you need to make. Overall, do I want to be associated with this company? And that's on the surface. And then more importantly, I guess, is, well, what's it actually like day-to-day -day working there? Do I enjoy it? Do I want to get out of bed and go to this place and work there because it's an excellent experience every day? Because if it's not, you're just going there for the money. And if money is the only motivator, I mean, money is important, but if money is the only motivator, then you've got a job, you don't have a, a career. I'm going to politely disagree on a couple points. I think, yeah, looking at the wide world and all the things we do in it, doing a job for the money is, yeah, not something that everybody wants to aim for. But I think it's pretty, yeah, I think it's entirely reasonable. Oh, yeah, it's important to have money. And having a career might not be, you might just want a job because you've got more important things to do with your life. That's perfectly acceptable. But if you, considering how much time we spend at work, I think it's important to at least have most or a good chunk of the work you've done being enjoyable and preferably fun. Because if we do a job that's fun, then we're actually much more productive when we're in a fun job rather than a job that drags every day. Well, let's let's compromise on this. So let's say I'm looking for a job. I've learned some closure. I've built the demo. I've sat down and thought about what is or isn't too evil for me. And then I've done some research on companies. And if I'm lucky, if I'm really, really lucky... I can go ahead and aim for companies that not only pay me okay, but actively don't make me miserable. Yeah. What do I do now? Well, you, you apply. Um, so you need to find out who to apply to, uh, what to actually say when you're applying. And again, going to meetups and stuff or listening to people. If you know somebody works at a place and they've done some presentations or some videos or something, you can actually get some idea about what they're talking about, what their concerns are, and how would you address them? And trying to elaborate that on your CV or, or in your covering letter and tell them why you want to go and work there, why you want to do functional programming, why you love closure, those kind of things. <laughs> Disclosure, just, yeah. Well, yeah, you're, you're, okay. you're a closure dev in this scenario, so it's... I'm, I'm very much, yes. I'm a fantastic closure dev, thank you very much. There, there are other languages, obviously. I think, <laughs> I think that's... The, <laughs> Allegedly. Yeah, yes. You express, um, people term this as passion, but just your enthusiasm, why you want to go work there, what kind of things you think you can offer. Even they could be what other people consider less interesting aspects. You really love testing, and you really love kind of getting testing into an organization. And then if you've read somebody's blog where... They're saying, well, we don't do enough testing. Then obviously you've got some connection there and it's making that connection, at least uh, certainly in the initial submission of your CV and cover letter or the initial conversation, making that connection as quickly as possible and building on it, it helps the job application process along a lot, lot smoothly. One point you made that I think a lot of folks, either very new to the industry or who don't especially like job hunting, might not be as familiar with, it sounded a bit like you recommended some very gentle professional stalking. Uncreepy stalking. Um, 
<laughs> well, you might you call it stalking. I call it just uh, research. Oh, that's that's how you say uncreepy stalking, isn't it? Well, it, you're not actually physically following them around. Hopefully, anyway, uh, that, that would be. Uh, well, I, I guess if you go to their meetup and they're talking, then <laughs> is that stalking or is it just appreciating what they're saying? I mean, I, I guess it depends how far you take it. Uh, <laughs> We're going to go ahead and put it out right now that we are not encouraging you to take it to unwanted or creepy places. Yeah, if you turn up and you've got a tattoo of their uh, Twitter handle on your arm, then that's probably stalky. Yeah, I, I feel like it got stalky several <laughs> points before the tattoo. <laughs> but it's a good indicator. If you got that far, then, yeah, I might want to back off a bit. But, like, yeah, doing some some sort of research on what companies you might want to work for, yeah. what people you could see in those companies, and then check out what kind of things do they write about, what kind of things do they talk about, what kind of things do they care about. Yeah, sorry, and it doesn't have to be a single person. I mean, obviously... Uh, <laughs> you yeah. can stalk many people. Many people, yeah. Well, most companies have, a like, an engineering blog now. Even small companies, they usually have, like, a little engineering blog because that's one tool that they use to attract people because it's a two parts of the coin. I mean, you want a job, but they want to hire people. So they're advertising their culture, their people, because they want to find similar people in terms of enthusiasm, in terms of getting involved in things and sharing with the wider world what's going on within that company as well. So reading engineering blogs from companies is a good way to kind of understand that kind of technical side of the culture. So if I've identified a person, I'm like, or people, and I've nicely, non-creepily learned some about them and maybe run into this, I've made friends, should I just go ahead and apply through, through the website or should I chat to them first and go through a personal contact? Well, it does seem that more companies have like a hiring manager now or like an in-house HR. And a lot of technical companies have one that works directly with the engineering team. So they have some understanding about what it is that they're doing. So I think talking to those kind of people directly is really useful. I mean, you can do the wide net of just sending out to recruitment consultants, especially if you want um, some of the financial services, they they work with specific recruitment consultants as well. So if you want to get into that area, you might need to do that because they usually the bigger the company, the more separate the HR organization is, and it's just a general HR stuff. So they're kind of, it's harder to kind of get that connection. So you usually have to go and find the engineering teams that you want to talk to and get them interested in you. Otherwise, you're in with like hundreds of other CVs that it's like very hard to make a difference uh, with. And you're going to a HR company that might not know that you've written one thing and they're actually looking for some other thing, but what you've written is actually the thing that the engineering team is looking for. I love how we're talking about functional programming and like getting that first job in functional programming, but we're right back to the thing, thing, thing that we were very object-oriented on earlier. All of the things. Well, yeah, there are some really interesting companies out there. So, so I'll give a shout out to Functional Works, which is a recruitment consultancy that's very friendly, but it's focused on functional programming jobs. So that's one way to see at least see what's out there and the kind of jobs and the kind of salaries that are available and the also the kind of experience you want. So even if you don't go Ooh. through them, it's a good idea to kind of get a picture of the market and what's available. But there are other recruitment consultancies, obviously. So I've learned some closure. Yeah. I built a thing. Yeah. I wrote a tutorial about the thing. Yeah. I've gotten out there and networked. I did some research without stalking anyone. Yeah. And I've reached out to some of these contacts and say, hey, I'm interested in it. So getting that first job in tech or getting that first job in functional programming, is it going to be super easy? Can I just chill out now? I've, I've sent one person my, my resume. I'm done, right? Well, I, I, yeah, absolutely. Well, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, well. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, it should be. The actual reality of actually doing interviews, I, I still hate doing interviews. I would find them very uncomfortable. But, I mean, the interview process is like when you're speaking uh, or presenting. I mean, people want you to be successful. They, they don't want to have an interview where you fail miserably because it's a waste of their time as a waste of yours. They're keen to have you kind of like yeah, show off what you can do, who you are, how you think, how you reason about things. You're going to be nervous, especially if it's a job that you really – are excited about yeah um, but it's kind of letting that excitement override any kind of nervousness that you have as well and, and sometimes that just takes practice you know, practice a few key messages that you actually want to get across so like uh, i'll talk about something that you thought was really important when you built your thing in closure you built a, a nice to-do list thing there and you think <laughs> it's really cool but because of something, because of X, this X decision you made. And you could talk about, I really liked doing this enclosure because of this immutability of the language by design. 
because uh, everything I do is immutable. So nothing changes without me driving it. And explain that. And so that could be a focal point of the whole interview, like, because it's an important thing. And you know, it's an important thing in the language. You know, that. Uh, Just uh, turn it into a beautiful monologue about well, immutability. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you could, you could quite easily talk for hours about that. So. <laughs> and we'll spare our lovely audience us talking for hours on immutability. That'll be the next one. The ne- next, we'll have you back. And it'll just be okay. wall-to-wall immutability monologues. Yeah. Oh, the immutability monologues. That sounds good. Uh, mm. <laughs> <laughs> so are there any sort of words of advice or support you've got? If somebody's learned the skills, built the thing, written stuff up, gone for a little bit of visibility, they're networking, they're going for the jobs, they're getting these interviews... Do you have any sort of words of wisdom or words of encouragement for folks who are doing everything right, but it's not landing quite yet? Well, I think if you take the words from, I think it was Journey, which is a, a rock band <laughs> from the same, but they have a song called Don't Stop Believing. And I think that's important. It's like, don't stop believing in yourself. If you built something and you have something to say, you should feel free to say it. It shouldn't be offensive. It can be different from what other people think. It can challenge other people's ideas. You might not think it's particularly interesting, but it's something you've learned. And if you understand something and have an opinion about something, you should feel free to share that and discuss that and debate it with people. That's how you learn. But you should also be open to what they're saying and listen to the feedback that you're getting from people. If everybody is saying one thing, Uh, at the end of the interview, then, okay, well, you might need to change something around that feedback. But you should never think that you can't do this just because somebody doesn't give you a job, because they make decisions based on fairly basic choices and fairly basic snap decisions they make. They make a choice on when they read your CV, they make a choice on when they first see you, the first couple of questions they ask can kind of shape the interview. And if they don't go well and It's nothing about you. It's just the fact that you have a conversation with somebody that aren't always going to be positive. Yeah. Fantastic. Very solid advice. Like We've got a really good sort of framework for what kinds of steps you can make if you want to get into functional programming and get that job. And some really great encouragement and some advice to listen to some journey uh, when the process gets tough or a little bit dank. It's on Spotify. You can get it on Spotify and other musical streaming services, obviously. Uh, Thank you very much for joining us, John. Is there any place people can find you online if they want to hear more of your words of wisdom or journey lyrics? Yeah, sure. People are more than free to stalk me online on Twitter. <laughs> My handle is jrocket with a zero, not just because it's leet, because somebody else had it without a zero. <gasps> Maybe you'll get it back in the Twitter purge. Maybe one day. It's my dream. Oh, you can also reach out to me at the London Closureians as well. I help organize that community and we run lots of meetups, uh, lots of practical meetups as well. So if you want to come try out Closure, it's a beginner-friendly way to uh, get involved. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having us, Jess. And thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to keep up with what we're doing at the Pursuit Podcast, you can find us on Twitter at Pursuit Pod.